I'm really thankful. Um, first of all, when I was hanging out with some of you, I really feel like um, that same spirit of love for Jesus, it reminds me of when I was actually here on campus. And I just really, I'm really thankful for that. Just, you know, just the things and the sharing. And a lot of you have shared quotes with me and things you're learning. Like, praise the Lord. That just really has warmed my heart. And uh, thankful for being in the boys' dorm. The, the prayer has just really been reminding me and, and also talking to the girls. And it's just really been a blessing. I thank, I thank the Lord for this guy. I remember when he was a freshman. And just to see the Lord working in his life, I was like, wow, just praise God, you know. There's just so many things I'm thankful for I could go on. But um, we do have a few minutes. I want to take a few minutes because um, there's a few questions that we want to take. And by the way, if, you have, if we have time, uh, to, to, we'll, if you have any questions that you want to write down, I think there was some cards somewhere. We could pass those out. But right before we do that, I'm going to ask you just quickly, if you can just stand up. And just, uh, if you can just stretch forward, we can just do that. Stand up and stretch forward. That'll be great. Oh, thank you. All right. As soon as you're done with that, you can take a seat. And we'll, we're going to have another word of prayer just because I need the Lord's, the Lord's help in answering these questions. And then we have some cars that are going to go around. And you can write your question down. And is someone collecting those? Bringing, bringing them up. All right, so we have someone who will collect those for us. You can raise your hand. Who's going to be collecting that? All right. Okay, so everyone's sitting down now. Right before we start, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. And then we'll, we'll get into that. Our Father in heaven, thank you again for the Sabbath. Thank you for the testimonies. And Lord, as we look at some questions that, um, spiritual questions, things that we can apply to our lives, we need your divine wisdom. Lord, I know and I trust, I know that there's, there's so many answers in this audience than I have in my head. But Lord, I know that you are a God that give us wisdom beyond our years. And so I'm claiming that, I'm claiming that you would give me that wisdom, um, but we would really, we would really answer questions that would help us draw closer to you. We ask these gifts in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so as they're passing those out, if you, I guess if you want a card, you can just raise your hand. They can pass one out to you, and then they'll collect that. Um, so we're going to begin with some questions. All right, I was reading over some of them, and um, let's see. Let's start with this one here. Someone asked me the question, what's your favorite verse, and who is your favorite Bible character? You know, I think at this point in my life, you know, I think my, my favorite verses may change based on my experience. And I think right now my favorite verse and my favorite Bible character is Sarah. Just because that meant so much to me, her experience of having to, it's like she was sitting on the judgment seat of her mind. And she's weighing the evidence or her, her circumstances versus the evidence God gave her. And the verdict of her mind said, you know, God is faithful. And there's so many times in my life I've had to do that. Uh, I had to judge God faithful in spite of what my circumstances are. And even right now, my family's going through a current situation where I'm having to do that. And so right now, that, that story just really speaks to me, and her life really speaks to me. Also, I'll just say this. Also the fact that she, she had to come to the point where we, she wasn't relying on Abraham's faith. You know, she wasn't like, oh, you know what? All those blessings are for Abraham, but not for me. She had to come to the point where she had to have faith for herself. Then God moved in the entire family. Didn't catch that. They both had to have faith for themselves. Then God bless. And that really moved, that really moved my heart. So good question. All right. Someone asked the question, if I know my burden is my fault, how do I give my burden to God? That's a really, really good question. Someone just recently, we were talking about that back at the school at Oklahoma Academy. Someone was bringing up the same question. There's a story that comes to my mind, um, the story of the man that was, that was uh, being let down in, from the roof. You know, you remember that? His sickness was his fault. His sickness was his fault. And we see how Jesus actually handled that. But there's something that really, really comes to mind um, 
Let me just say this, and I'm going to come back to that story. Something I think is really, really interesting is people, when they, when they get into a, a relationship, you know, sometimes some people, um, they have a little debt, or one person may have a little debt, or two may have a little debt, uh, or both may have a little debt. Something I find is very interesting, and I'm not saying every situation they do this, but when those individuals get married, it's, not, it's no longer that's your debt, it's that's our debt. I feel the same way when we come into a relationship with Jesus. Jesus is like, listen, I know you were at fault, and I want to heal you, but also your fault, I like, he, it's, like, it's like he takes that and says, look, come with me with your fault, even though it's your fault, but when we come to God in repentance, God takes that too. God takes it. And that story of the man being let down the roof is a perfect example of how God handles it. Uh, the, you have other stories in the Bible. The, the man at the, at the pool of Bethesda, you know, it was his fault that he was in that situation. How did God treat him? How did God treat him? And, um, yeah, so we can still give God that burden. Don't, you can't bear that yourself. You know, why else did Jesus die? He died to take on that burden. So give it to him. You know, there's still, sometimes there's consequences for, for sins, but listen, Jesus says, listen, I'll, I'll take that burden. You can't bear it. The Bible says in, in first, uh, first Peter chapter 5 and verse 7, it says, cast all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. And you can claim that promise. Good question. By the way, I'm not sure how we, if someone had something like this, really dying, like, oh, I can help with that, or a thought, but I'm not sure if we're doing it that way or not. But um, I don't have all the answers. I don't claim to have them all. And if I don't know, I'll just tell you. That's a good question. All right, here's a good question. It's, oh, I thought this was really good. And I'm guessing we have some other questions going around. This one said, if Jesus sympathized with all our weaknesses, but he was always in perfect health, how did he sympathize with our sickness? Wow, that's a really deep question. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know all of the miracle of what it means that Jesus took on our, our weaknesses. Ellen White likens this. Uh, she talks about the idea of Jesus was, was able to heal sicknesses and he took on our weaknesses. I, I'll be honest. I don't know all of the details of how that happened. Oh, thank you. Wow. But one thing I, do, I can say is that a lot of times when we look at, um, at Jesus being weak at every point or sinful at every point, um, we get very specific. For example, we was like, you know, if I struggle with Internet, how did Jesus know to struggle with Internet? He didn't have Internet in that day, right? No, seriously. So, the, so we, we look for, like, these very specific things, but what we have to look for is principle. And what can I see in the life of Jesus is that if we look at the principle of being sick, what is the struggle with being sick? Generally, you're weak. Generally, you're tired. There's things that happen, you know, it's like being sick, you just don't feel like doing certain things. Do you think Jesus experienced being weak? Do you think Jesus experienced being tired? So in principle, Jesus knows exactly how you feel. By the way, when he went to the cross, he hadn't eaten or drink or drank anything in like how many days, how many hours? And they're beating him and all these and now they're throwing a cross. Jesus was trying to push under the pressure of being weak. Who knows what his, what, you know, and this is just thought, but who knows what was happening to his body temperature? Who knows? We don't know. But Jesus, when you talk about him knowing in principle what it feels like to be weak and still being faithful, Jesus knows what that was like. He didn't do anything himself to make himself sick. He didn't do anything, or, or we don't have any, he didn't get sick, is what we're told. But he didn't do anything to bring that on, but he knew what it was like to be weak. So in principle, he knows what it's like. But there's, it's probably even deeper than that. But that's a, that's a really good question. And that's the same thing when you think about other things like, like was Jesus tempted with Internet? How did he know? You know, he may not have been tempted with Internet, but there was other, the, the principle of it he was still tempted with. And, and that's very important. Okay, already, we already answered that question. Someone else asked the question here. Oh, wow. Okay. It says, are you courting someone right now? And any tips about that stage of life or maybe about singleness? So, by God's grace, I am courting someone right now. 
Uh, I believe the Lord is leading in that area. And so any tips? Okay, to be honest with you, I'm learning these tips myself. But I can tell you, probably one of the biggest ones I'm, I'm learning is, uh, well, two, is we constantly try to remind one another to make sure our first love and devotion is for God. First love and devotion is for God. And secondly, communication. And I think that's something that when people share with me, it's like that's, that's a reoccurring thing. You know, communication, communication. Uh, so learning that, learning how we communicate um, is something that's very important. Now, I can tell you a lot about singleness. <laughs> I think one of the blessings the Lord put in my life is that he let me be single for a long time. And so I know how to sympathize, empathize, whatever the, your question is. Um, these are some of the things that, that I had to really realize. For those who are struggling with singleness, um, one of the biggest things I realized, all right, I'm just going to be honest. I think one of the biggest things that people struggle with is support and loneliness. And even when I was single, I'll be honest, there was times I struggled with support and loneliness. Um, the Bible actually tells us in, in, in let's go in the Bible to Genesis, well, you may, may or may not have your Bible, but go with me to Genesis chapter 3, I believe, maybe chapter 2. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2. And this, we, we know this this passage, Genesis chapter 2, and let's look at verse, uh, let's see here. Verse 18, we're very familiar with this. It says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. And of course, God placed Adam in a situation. Adam was like, whoa, you know, everyone else has someone. God put him to sleep. You know the whole story. But when I read that passage, I remember, and oftentimes I heard it, people always apply that to marriage. Well, the truth of the matter is, there are social needs that human beings, beings need. And one of the things I had to realize is that, God, if you're not bringing someone in my life, I'm not going to go out and be like, okay, God, it's not good that man should be alone, so let me just go and find somebody. And just, you know, I wasn't doing that. I was like, Lord, you know every need that I have. If you know that I have social needs, then... The principle here is it's not good if man should be alone. You provide for that. And he did. Um, I had many friends that end up becoming really close as brothers. I had many people that I was constantly ministering to. God put me in situations to where my social needs. I had a lot of people. Here's the beautiful thing about being single. A lot of people invite you for the house. A house. They're like, look, they want to make you a part of the family, uh, generally. And so God, he, he was able to supply that. Uh, that need that I had for that time. And so don't think that you have to necessarily be in a, in a relationship in order to have your social needs met. God knows exactly what you need. In fact, there's a quote that became a, a, a huge quote for me. I remember one day thinking to myself, I was actually praying to God about it. I was like, God, this is really, this is difficult. And um, this was a quote that the Lord gave to me. Let me see if I can find it. Okay, listen to this. This is in uh, Mind, Character, Mind, Character, and Personality, uh, Volume 1, page 127. It says, feelings of unrest, homesickness. By the way, if any of you are homesick, your first time, or you know, being in the dorm or whatnot, this is a good quote. It says, or loneliness may be for your good. That was not exactly what I wanted to hear. She says, your heavenly father means to teach you to find in him the friendship and love and consolation that will satisfy your most earnest hopes and desires. So what I would really encourage is to make that relationship with God and say, Lord, be, show me how you can become my best friend. Show me how I can. And look, I would encourage you, this is, this is something I did, talk to God about your loneliness. Don't be ashamed to talk to God about the fact you're lonely. He cares about what your needs are. He's personal. Amen. So I just, when I feel a certain way, when I don't feel a certain way, I talk to God about it. That's, that's, God becomes that friend, but he also brings people in your life. Um, there was a few other things that, that I was... I wanted to share on that that really 
helped. Um, yeah. Oh, here's another thing that I, I, I realized. I realized that even when I, even when I was single, I, I got a chance to know a lot of Christian families, and I was able to talk to good mentors about um, just different things that I was, I was going through. I was able to have good Christian mentors that I could talk to. That was very helpful for me. And so when I was in a relationship, I had already built up this relationship with, with good godly mentors. And how do you find a godly mentor, by the way? Let me tell you the secret of finding a godly mentor, at least the one I found. The purpose of a godly mentor is to help direct you back to godly counsel. It's not just the idea of them just saying, like, hey, I got good counsel, this is my experience, or, you know, they may have good experience, that's, that's great. Um, that's, 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 like, wonderful. They may have nice books you can read, you know, from latest studies. That's, that's great. But the biggest thing I look for is, is this godly counselor a Bible student themselves or can help direct me back to Bible promises, Bible principles. When I find a counselor like that, because that's what I'm looking for mainly, I'm looking for, okay, what does the Bible have to say about this? But there may be things I've missed. And so when I'm talking to a godly counselor, they're like, look, you know what? The principle of the word of God is this. You should, and that helps me. That's what I think is the real key to finding a godly counselor. That's something that's really blessed in me. Oh, wow, okay. How much time do we have? We may want to stop you a little bit before supper is what I'm guessing, right? All right, let me, let me, uh, I don't know what order these are in. Okay, okay. All right, someone put down here, thoughts on the Apocrypha. It's been a long time since I studied thoughts on the Apocrypha. So I'm going to uh, defer this question to someone else who may have more understanding on it. <laughs> Don't be shy. We're all family here. <laughs> all right, we'll defer. We'll hold it. We'll put it to the side. All right. Let me see if I can read this one. It says, what would be one thing that you would, that you would say to a young person who is battling with selfishness and pride. Hmm. Actually, there's two things I can say. Number one, spend more time beholding Jesus. And what I mean by that is, when you have devotions, I would really encourage you spending uh, time uh, on the life of Jesus, uh, the stories of Jesus. Desire of Ages is a beautiful book. And don't just have your devotions and then be done. But throughout your, like, whatever you learn, just take one point and think about that throughout the day. That's the one thing. Because you're constantly, as the more you reflect on Jesus, see, the problem oftentimes is that we have devotions and then we stop. Well, how many hours do we, are we normally, like, during our day? How, much, how many hours do we have? Like, tw well, it's a little bit more than 12 generally. Um, huh, 14, 16? We generally have, let's just say someone has like one hour. Most of, There's a lot of people who don't even do that. But you have one hour a day you're spending time with Jesus, and you have 15 hours where your, your mind is not on Jesus. What are you going to think about most? What are you going to look like most? You're going to look about like all the other stuff you're thinking about. But if you're, you're taking Jesus with you in your thoughts, and this is something I've learned, you start to like, wow, you start to shape, your, your, your mind starts to shape into Jesus' mind. So the one thing is, Dwell on the stories of Jesus and then take time to think about it. Think about what you learned. Think about, and not just, oh, wow, you know, that was a really nice story. But then think about that story. It's like, how, if, Jesus, if that story was like to happen in my day, what would that look like? If that story happened in my situation, if Jesus was in my situation, based on what I learned from his character, what would that look like in this situation? So I'm thinking about, I'm, I'm going around, I'm thinking about this a lot. Like, and that, that shapes you. Um, the other thing is find people to serve. Find others to serve. There's nothing that kills pride and selfishness like serving others the way Jesus was serving. So those are, those are like the two things I've learned about battling with pride and selfishness. Um, and then, of course, uh, pray. Pray about it. Like I talk to God. Don't be ashamed. Like, Lord, I'm selfish. Lord, I'm prideful. I've really had to do that. Let me tell you something. 
Over the years, I've had to do that after I finish a sermon. Lord, I'm prideful. Like, I, Lord, did you get all the glory there? Because I don't even know my heart. So I have to really be honest with God about that. You know? I think those are the most valuable things I can, I can share with you about dealing with, battling with pride and selfishness. And by the way, I think I would, I would dare to say probably all of us deal with that in some way, shape, or form. Selfishness for sure. It says, how do you know when, when you have committed the unpardonable sin? Okay, so I don't know what, what necessarily what was the, the motive behind this question, but let me tell you, I really believe that if you ask this question, I doubt you committed the unpardonable sin. I really doubt that. Um, here's the funny, here's the interesting thing. A lot of people who committed the unpardonable sin do not know they've committed the unpardonable sin. And the unpardonable sin is, is, is really just simply the Holy Spirit um, not being able to move your heart. You, you've, you've said no to God so much, God is not able to move your heart anymore. And Ellen White makes this statement. She says, a person that feels no remorse, no, they, they, need, they feel they need no forgiveness, um, or no, they need not to repent. And, that's, and she says, as a result, they receive no forgiveness. So it's, it's not like, you know, like it's just the point that God has been moving. He's trying to work, trying to work. And you're just saying, you know, no, no, no. And so a lot of times people who commit the unpardonable sin, they don't realize they've committed the unpardonable sin. But if you're realizing like, wow, I'm really bad, or, or in my case, I honestly thought I committed the unpardonable sin, but I kept saying like, I kept drawing to Christ, but I was like, I don't feel anything. I don't feel anything. So I was trying to work up a feeling, and I was trying to read all the books. This was, this was a really interesting experience. I remember... I believe that Satan was really trying to, to work on this, but I thought that I had done so much evil against God that he couldn't forgive me at one point in my life. And I remember opening books, and I would open up the Desire of Ages, and it would turn to the story of Judas. I'm like, oh. And then I open up another book, and it turned to the story of Achan. I'm like, I was like, what in the world is going on? So I was like, maybe, surely I've, I've, done, I've done far too much wrong. But the more I started, I said, you know what? I'm going to keep reading these books. And I remember one day it touched my heart. I was crying like a baby. God had showed me myself, but I was so focused on trying to fix my own heart. So I would really encourage anyone who may have thought that they've committed the unpardonable sin, keep beholding Jesus. Keep beholding Jesus. Books like Steps to Christ, Desire of Ages, and um, yeah, if you're asking that question, you probably, I'm quite sure you haven't. Okay, let's see what time we have, okay. So the question is, what is your stand in Christian contemporary music? So this is what I, I, I think I know. I'm not the music expert, but I, I think at one point all music was con contemporary. Is that true? Okay, so I don't really look at, I know what you mean though. I know there's a certain style, but what I really look at are principles, I try to look at principles for, for music. And um, some of the principles I, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, right away is um, I, tell, I tell individuals, I remember a young man one time when I was my first, when I was Bible working, he came to me, he was like, look, you know, what, you, what is your thought on music? And he, he was saying, I love to debate on music. So I guess he was really into certain types of music, um, like a rock style or whatever. And I told him, I was like, you know what, I really believe, this is what came to my mind then, I said, I really believe that music ought to prepare my, my mind to hear the word of God. If it's distracting me from preparing my mind to hearing the word of God, I don't need it. Because I need God to be constantly in tune here. And then I shared with him, I was like, you know what, I've been to a lot of places, a lot of churches where people get up, and believe me, I've been to a lot of, a lot of them, and they'll get up and they'll, they'll dance, they'll move, they'll do all these different things. And that same church, unless you have an exciting sermon, something that's entertaining, t entertaining um, you're, you're doing something entertaining up front, those same individuals will fall asleep um, on, a, on a pretty decent sermon. I'm not talking about a sermon that's like just long and the person's really, really boring. But on a sermon, it's like, wow, this is truth. The same people will be like, oh, they'll go out, walk out, go to sleep. They just, their minds weren't prepared to hear the word of God. 
And so that was one of the biggest things that, that I looked at. And I was like, you know, and this is why I, I could listen to, I couldn't do gospel, gospel rap. Um, another thing that was interesting to me is that if there's music that turns my heart, for me, if there's music that turns my heart back to thinking about worldly music, because it's so closely aligned or so closely related to it, then I'm like, you know what, I don't need that in my life. Um, there are some other principles I haven't, this is a question, of, those are the things that come to my mind right now, but if you ask this question, maybe if I think about it and I can talk to you personally, there will be probably some other thoughts that come to my mind, but those are the ones that come to my mind right away. I'm not a really big music person anymore. So, to be honest with you, I don't even, I don't listen to music when I drive as much. I try to sing now because I see that's very beneficial to me, and singing out loud it's very beneficial to keep my mind on Christ, but I don't generally buy music or, so I don't generally deal with topics of music as much, but if I think about it, and if you ask that question, I would love to talk with you personally, and maybe I'll have some more thoughts by then. All right. How do I have more faith in God? Hmm, good question. How do I have more faith in God? Oh, boy. Where should I start with this one? The biggest thing is using the faith you have. Using, like, claiming God's promises, spending time in, in God's word. And I think the, the, here's the thing. We have to believe that God is who he says he is. We have to believe that. And so when we spend time with God and his word, what's, what ends up happening, the more we think about it, is like, wow, God can really do that. Uh, I share with you, you all the story about, uh, for example, when I was praying and there was, you know, fleas in my house. Well, I had been reading about how God was doing these amazing things and I had to really think, like, God, are you that same God? You can really do this. And so when I was praying, I was like, Lord, if you could really pray, it's because I had filled my mind with the testimonies of the word of God so much that when I was praying, I believed that God heard me because my faith was growing because of the things I had read. I had heard those testimonies. And then that experience gave me strength and faith enough for the next experience. And that's the thing. God will give you a test that is, that is, I don't know if you want to say big enough or small enough for you to handle. He knows you can handle. You have a choice. And you can claim the promise of God for that test. And the neat thing is when you pass that test by the grace of God, then now you have something in your bag to when you get to the next test. It might be bigger. But you get to the next test, you're like, look, I remember God did this. Do we have an example of the Bible when that happened? How about David? Remember, remember the story of David? Why was he able to fight Goliath? They're like, look, you're just a boy. You're just... And David says, look, I fought a lion. God, I fought a bear. God did that for me. What's this Philistine? So he was able to draw back on the experience from before, and it strengthened his faith for the present but he also had to hold on to the, presence, to the, to the power of God. And so that, that's really what I've seen personally in my life has helped me to grow in my faith is because I listen to the testimonies of, of others and then I had the experience that God has given me. And I'm like, Lord, you can do it then, you can do it now. So, so those are the, um, speaking of testimonies, by the way, my brother's talking about testimonies. That's why testimonies are so important. I remember when I was a kid, I used to watch the... Not all the time, but like the, the OxyClean commercials. You don't remember that? Man, I got to the point, I never used OxyClean that I can know, remember, but I got to the point I thought OxyClean could clean everything. Because the guy was so excited about it, and then you have the testimonials. And the people are like, yeah, I did this and this, I dipped in, it, in OxyClean, and it worked. And everyone was, I was like, wow, OxyClean is great. Well, guess what? Jesus needs his own OxyClean testimonials. He needs people who's going to get up like, this is what Jesus did for me. And people are like, wow, Jesus can actually do that? That strengthens people's faith. Strengthens people's faith. All right. Okay, so how about 45? And we'll try to pick some. <laughs> There's a few here. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. All right, so I'll, I'll ask this and I'll let someone tell me when. Okay, 
says, how do you treat someone kindly when they aren't trying to do the same? And how do you remain calm so they aren't offended? Whew. There's a lot that could have. This is one of those situations, this is one of those uh, questions where I, that, that if I were, if I were trying to decide a situation, I'd probably say I probably need more information on this. Uh, just because, yeah, how to treat someone calling me. I've, 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 I'm guessing that you're in a conversation, and this is a conversation you can't walk away from. I don't know. Um, they aren't trying to do the same. Ooh. I think the first thing is to pray. You can pray in your mind on this one. Um, yeah. And not so much even just, just for them, but praying for yourself. I, I know many times, and I'm the type of person, I used to like to argue. I used to like to debate, and I don't like backing, I didn't like backing down to people. The Lord has helped me with that. But um, my biggest prayer was, Lord, help me to listen first. Like, help me to listen to what they're saying and to keep, just be quiet and listen to what they're saying and, and see if I'm understanding it and if, the, if the, it's possible and they're not really getting along, maybe I'll say, look, I hear what you're saying. Um, maybe we can, do you think we can revisit this? You know, maybe calming down and say, look, can you think we can revisit this? But I think the biggest thing uh, is staying calm is trying to is praying and trying to see get an understanding of why they're upset. Um, trying to ask the Lord to help you get an understanding. Uh, again, there's there's probably a lot into this situation. I've been into some situations like this. I remember being in, uh, in charge of a certain thing that was happening, and the next thing I knew, someone just the first thing they did was this blow up. They just blew straight up, and it wasn't even something that was my fault. It was something that that was happening a series of events, but I just happened to be the person in charge that moment, and I got all the back history of whatever happened to him and just blew up on me. And my first reaction was to be upset. And I was like, Lord, what, what? I had to pray. And the next thing, I was like, okay, I understand you're upset. Let's sit down. Let me hear what you're saying. Because as a, at, at this point, I really don't understand. And I just heard him out. I heard him out, and I was like, okay, so based on this, and I repeated to make sure he understood, I understood what he was saying, and I was like, look, let me go see what I can do. I'm going to pray and figure out what these issues are, you know. So that was just how I treated that situation, to try to calm it down, but I had to really, really pray myself. So, I don't know, that's a, 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 there's different situations there. Okay. Okay, why do I still struggle with the sin that with my whole heart I don't want. And I've given full permission for God to take away. I've been asking for a very long time, and it's not going away. You know, there was a moment in my life that I struggled with the sin for a very long time, and I was asking the very same question. And I had a really good mentor of mine give me a sheet. And the sheet that he gave me was a full of Ellen White quotes. And it was basically on the sermon that I talked about this morning. It was learning to recognize my need, but also my dependence. And I think a lot of us, um, here, if I could summarize the, 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 the gospel of walking with Christ, I'd probably summarize it in, in surrender and dependence surrender and dependence and a lot of us we get to the point we're like you know um we're willing to to surrender we're willing to say lord take my life become my savior but we don't learn the method of dependence saying lord i recognize you as my lord and i can't do anything without you you have your part but lord i can't do anything without you and i think that depending on god becomes so crucial it's actually like a a biblical a, like like a skill, it's like a science in learning to depend upon God. And so for me, I was like, Lord, I want to give you my heart with everything. Now, sometimes there's things you have to search your heart with, and God, he, you know, you come to him really searching your heart, and God has to show you those things that are in your heart. Sometimes there's triggers there. He's like, wow, I didn't see that trigger. Or sometimes there's other baggage and things and, and emotions and feelings, and we don't even know ourselves. This is why Jesus had to come heal the brokenhearted. 
Jesus has to heal us spiritually, physically, mentally, all that stuff. So Jesus has to really get deep with us sometimes. But also we have to learn the dependence that, Lord, I need you. I always need you. I, don't, I didn't know how desperately I need you. And I need to do my part in obeying. But, Lord, I'm dependent upon you for every moment that I'm, that I'm obeying. And so with, with the thing I struggled with in my life, that was the thing that really helped me. It really helped me to know that I have to learn the science of, of depending on God. I call it a science. I don't know if there's a better word for it. But by the way, I brought that sheet. And if, if the Lord lays on your heart to, to come and you know, talk to me, if I could, get, I, could, I could try to make copies of it because that was like one of the most powerful things. And I don't even know what I brought it. I just, I had it in my, in my room, and I was like, you know what? I have it on my desk, and I was like, I just need to take this. So if anyone wants it, I can find a way if I can make copies, and I can give it to you, because it was really, really something that, that encouraged my soul. Sure, most definitely. And just a whole lot of Ellen White quotes, just, all right, I'll just, maybe one more? Small fit. Sure. All right, we'll do that. It says, if you have a harsh father, how can you understand the love of God? Mm, really good question. And not just reading about it. Here's the beautiful thing about God. In the book Steps to Christ, God, first of all, God knew that this world, when, when sin came in, that this world would be marred by it. And it wasn't just the trees, it wasn't just the atmosphere, it was actually the family as well. And so God in his wisdom has given, more, has given more ways to reveal his love than just one. And what I mean by that is, you might have a father that is not reflecting Jesus, but think about maybe some other individuals in your family that is reflecting Jesus. Think about the individuals God has placed in your life, maybe a teacher, maybe someone that is reflecting Jesus. Number one, you have to understand that is who God can use to show you Christ. That's who God can use to show you Christ. That's, that's, that's number one. The other thing is, I challenge you, as you come to, to know God's word, you know, my father, as much as I, I love him, he was not perfect. In fact, as he was growing his Christian experience, I can remember my father would not always, I, I honestly don't, I could be wrong, but I honestly don't remember my father ever coming to me and putting his arm around me and hugging me until I was 13 years old and telling me he loved me. It wasn't he was ever abusive. It wasn't he ever, my, my dad was not a type person to raise his voice. He was just raised a certain way, and I don't ever remember him coming until I was 13 years old. God had really gotten a hold of him. He came and he was like, look, I love you. And I was like, wow, that meant a lot. So I had all these years of him not being the perfect reflection of Jesus. But guess what? I start, and, and even, even now, he's still growing. He's, he's, you know, he's not perfect. But as I start to get acquainted with the Bible myself, I start seeing what does a father, what should a father really look like? And I start seeing like, wow, Jesus is like that. His, his love is deeper than a mother. My mother was very caring and compassionate. Jesus' love is deeper than that. Wow, Jesus is like that. Jesus is more patient than my teachers. You know, I had some pretty patient teachers. So I really got acquainted with what a father should be like by looking at the life of Jesus. But I also saw the other blessings, the way God was showing his love to me. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of wounds in a, in a lot of our, in our hearts, and, but God has so many other ways to reflect. And so I look at those, those areas as, man, that's a, that's a reflection God put in my life of his love. Um, and then you pray for your father. Pray for him. Yeah. Okay, well, let's close out for this segment with the word of prayer. There's some other, I'll look over some of these other questions and hopefully we'll find some good ones to, to bring out. All right, let's pray. Let's kneel. In. I'm going to kneel. If you want to join me, that's okay. If you just want to bow your head, that's fine too. Our Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you so much for Jesus. I thank you for the questions my friends here were, were that they have. It shows me that they have a heart to know you. And I pray, Lord, that 
you would, you would work personally in their lives. You would speak to their hearts. And maybe there was something I said by your grace that touches their lives. I pray that um, you, by the grace of your Holy Spirit, you would water uh, that seed and you would, you would really speak to them. And that you would speak to me. Father, I pray that you'll be with us for the rest of this evening. We ask for your blessing and your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are so pleased you could join us for the special event here at Watch the Hills Academy and College. If you have enjoyed this presentation as much as I have, like, share, and subscribe. Also, if you would like to help support the making of these programs, you can find the donation information in the description below. Thank you for joining us, and may God richly bless you.